morning uh, before church. Um, not every morning. Every Sunday morning before church at uh, 10 o'clock. There's a Sunday school class for everyone, and we'd love to have you here. Um, our call to worship today comes from Psalm 21. Um, but first I'm going to read just the last few verses of Psalm 20 before we get into it. And I hope you see um, something interesting that we'll see here. So the last verse of Psalm 20 says, Lord, give us victory to the king. May he answer us on the day that we call. So now in Psalm 21 it says, Lord, the king finds joy in your strength. How greatly he rejoices in your victory. You have given him his heart's desire and have not denied the request on his lips. As we've been going through the Psalms, each one connects to the other um, in some ways. And this one's evident in the fact that Psalm 20 is requesting um, the Lord to give victory to the king. And Psalm 21 is praising the Lord for the victory that was given. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today and ask him to be with us this morning. Heavenly Father, as we see your example in the Psalms, um, if um, we ask that what's in your will to be done, God, you will provide that victory to us. Um, you will be with us because you are, um, you are a good and gracious king to us. You give us ways that we can come to you um, in song and in, in your word. Um, through the Holy Spirit, and Lord, we can come to you to praise you today um, because of the redemption that was had at the cross when your son died for us, um, so that one day um, when your act of reconciliation is complete, we will be with you um, in heaven um, when Christ comes again. Uh, but be with us today. I pray that you find our songs pleasing to your ears, and the joyful noise um, from our mouths be lifted up to you um, in praise. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So now let's stand together as we sing our first song, Standing on the Promises of God.
fulfilling his promises because he's given us a firm foundation through Christ who brings us salvation. So now let us look at Calvary um, for that salvation that was given. So sing with us at Calvary. pray over the offering. Now at Calvary, um, mercy was great and grace was free, and so we're beckoned to run to him um, for the forgiveness of our sins. Now let us sing, Come Ye Sinners.
pray once more. Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word, I pray that you ring true in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, um, the word that is brought. You will reveal um, what your um, writers through the Holy Spirit had written so long ago that still applies today to our hearts. And be with Brother Travis um, as he brings the message. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Before we begin, I want to pray again before we proceed forward. So let's pray. Uh, Lord, I know we just come to you in prayer, but we're thankful that we have that privilege and uh, you've given us the opportunity to come. And Lord, before we begin this morning, I just want to thank you for uh, those who have uh, led worship this morning. Lord, thank you for leading Micah into uh, my life, Lord, and uh, you've given him the ability to exercise his spiritual gift and leading us through song and Lord, thank you for Miss Angela and Miss Cynthia everybody that participated this morning Lord thank you for them and and allowing them to use their spiritual gift to build us up as a congregation Lord we understand as we go forward that you pre you've prepared a spiritual meal this week and uh, Lord you've placed it inside my heart and I pray that Lord as I as I seek to serve this spiritual meal this morning, I pray that I wouldn't drop the plate. Lord, as I present your word, I pray that it would, the spiritual meal would come forward in a fresh, uh, hot way in which we can enjoy this meal, we can internalize it, and it can bring about strength for the rest of this week. Uh, Lord, I thank you that we have come this far in 1 Thessalonians, and, and I pray that you continue to use this study to, to build us up and encourage us and point out any way in which we're uh, being rebellious to you, not only as individuals, but also as a church. Lord, I ask that you would use our time this morning. Help us to understand we're, we're never going to get this time back. Help us to be proactive and, and really paying attention this morning and uh, use the most of our time. Uh, Lord, help us to stay focused and please help us not to become distracted by lesser things. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Uh, church family, if you will, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And as you start turning to 1 Thessalonians 5, you can remain seated. You'll notice that once you finally get there to 1 Thessalonians 5, we're coming to the end of our study here in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, I'm hoping within the next few weeks that we'll finish up our study in 1 Thessalonians and then transition in, uh, to a different letter in which the Lord is uh, going to reveal to us then. But this morning, if you've been studying 1 Thessalonians with us, you'll understand that over the past couple of weeks, the Lord has, through the Apostle Paul, given us a lot of responsibilities. He's given us a lot of duties that we as sheep and also as shepherds are to uphold. I mean, there's just a lot that the Lord's told us we need to do. And so the Apostle Paul uses this last part of his letter to help us to understand that all of these commands, all of these responsibilities can take place only through the source in which God provides. So all... The last few weeks you could have been here and you've listened and, and you may have felt overwhelmed, like how am I going to be able to do this? I don't understand how I can keep these responsibilities. I just don't understand how. So then if you're in your Bible in 1 Thessalonians, look at verses 23 and 24 because Apostle Paul is going to show us how we can uphold these responsibilities. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, begin to read in verse number 23, the Bible says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse number 24 says this, He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. 
So here in these verses, just these two verses, Paul describes to us how we can keep all of those responsibilities that we talked about in previous weeks. There's only one way that all this can be done, and that's through God. The Lord who, in verse number 23, uh, tells us that He's the one that sanctifies us. He's the one that works within the life of the obedient Christian. So let me just summarize before we go on. The rest of our time this morning, we're going to be talking about sanctification. Now, that's a big word, and it's okay if you're here this morning and you don't understand what it means. Because Lord willing, by the time we're done today, unless the Lord comes back, hopefully by the time we're done this morning, you're going to be able, as a listener of the sermon here this morning, we're going to be able to understand what sanctification is. We're going to understand what God is doing in the life of a believer to make them look more like Christ. That's our goal this morning, to define and to discover what biblical sanctification looks like. So Paul, in verses 23 and 24, is going to reveal the essential elements of sanctification. So let's start. Point number one this morning is this. We're going to talk about sanctification's nature. We're going to talk about sanctification's source and the extent of sanctification. This is on your screen if you're taking notes. So let's just, let's pull it down. Look in verse number 23 at the first part. The Bible says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. So here's the question. What is sanctification? What does that word even mean? You've probably heard preachers for years and years talk about it, but what is it? What is sanctification? What does it mean? To sanctify means to set apart. Uh, sanctify means to separate from sin to holiness. What does it mean to sanctify? To set something apart from sin and to holiness. So sanctification means, what is it? It's the ongoing process in which God himself removes sin. It sets believers apart from sin and moves them towards holiness. All right, so we're going to talk about this more here in just a second. But in our study in 1 Thessalonians, we've actually talked about sanctification a little bit back in chapter 3. Uh, if you've got your Bible this morning, turn back to chapter 3 and let's, let's see what Paul's already said about sanctification. Back in chapter 3, verse number 11, Paul says this. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. Verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he's briefly talked about sanctification, but we need to dig deeper. What is sanctification? Now this word here, to sanctify, isn't something that we just find in the New Testament. The process in which God sets something apart from sin and to holiness goes actually all the way back to the Old Testament. God sanctifying things actually goes back all the way to creation. In Genesis chapter 2, when the Creator God is doing His creative work, six days He created and then on the seventh, what did he do? He sanctified, he set apart that day for holiness. So to sanctify, to set something apart, goes all the way back to Genesis 2, verse number 3. Let me give you some more Old Testament examples of, of sanctifying. In Exodus chapter 13, the first two verses in that chapter, God sanctified or he told his people to sanctify the firstborn and the firstborn of the animals, to be set apart for God's purpose. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, God sanctified, he set apart the nation of Israel as a holy nation. He set them apart from all the other sinful nations around them. God set them apart for a holy purpose. In Exodus chapter 28, verse number 41, God sanctified a man by the name of Aaron. 
and his sons for the priestly service. He set them apart for a holy purpose. Now, there's some Old Testament examples, but what about the New Testament? Do we have other examples of God setting apart, of God sanctifying people? We do. So, for example, Luke chapter 1, verse number 13, God set apart for a special purpose a man by the name of John the Baptist to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, God set apart the Messiah, His Son, for the work of redemption. So you guys get the point. I've given you a bunch of examples. Old and New Testament is full of God setting apart people, God setting apart things from sin. And then He moves them towards holiness. But what about us? What about the believer that's here this morning? How does God work in sanctification within Mr. Greg's life, or Emily's life, or my life, or Force's life? What, what it, how is that played out within the life of a believer? Now, I want to share with you this morning something I think will, will bring about clarity. Three elements of sanctification within the believer's life. So, within our life, how has God set us apart? How has God sanctified us, past, present, and future? The first is this, and I, I hope I put these on your notes. Yeah, number one is positional sanctification. In the life of a believer, this was past. This happened whenever you turned from sin and self and turned to Christ in faith. Positionally, you were sanctified in the past as a believer. Now, God affected at that time each saved believer. So you were set apart positionally when you turned to Christ in faith. Now, this positional sanctification was secured. Like This position can't be changed anymore. How? Through the death of God's Son. Listen to what the Bible says. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 10, but also verse number 14, the Bible says this. We have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. For by one offering he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. So because of Christ's work, his atoning work on the cross, positionally, as a believer, you've been set apart. Your position, where you stand before God, has been changed positionally because of Christ's work. So God has rescued believers from the dominion of sin and darkness, and positionally, he has now placed them in his dominion of light. So positionally, we've been set apart. Positionally, we've been changed. God took the righteousness of Christ, and he imputed them on the believer's behalf. So now when God the Father looks at us, he no longer sees a sinner, but instead... He sees one who is sanctified because of Christ's righteousness. This is what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. The Bible says, For our sake he made him, talking about Christ, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the first basic element of what happens in our lives as a believer in sanctification is positional Sanctification. Positionally, we're now different. How we stand before God is different. Now, let me reveal to you the second element of sanctification, and that is ultimate sanctification. So, we just talked about positional sanctification. That's in the past. Now, we're talking about ultimate sanctification, which is in the future. In the future, as a believer, you will be ultimately sanctified. Now, what does that even mean? This takes place when God makes believers sinless in body and in spirit forever. Man, that sounds good, right? This is what the Bible says. I'm going to explain this more. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So ultimate sanctification takes place in the future. That's when our new nature will meet our new body, our glorified body. That's ultimate sanctification. So there's the first two elements of sanctification. Now we need to talk about one that's happening right now. So we talked about what's happened in the past. We're talking about what's in the future. But what about us now? How's the Lord changing our heart now? Our third element is experiential sanctification. What we're experiencing right now. This involves our present Christian living. It involves what you're doing right now. Whether you're thinking about what's burning in the crock pot or if you're really engaged. This is experiential sanctification. This is the process which believers strive for through the Holy Spirit's power to be conformed into the image of Christ. Paul summed all this up in, in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He says this, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So experiential sanctification is the pursuit of holiness. That's what we're doing right now, day to day. So usually in Sunday school, when we use the word sanctification, this is what we're talking about, experiential sanctification. A lot of times we don't even get to those other layers of, the, of what happened in the past or the future. So I wanted you guys to get a, a more robust understanding of what the word even means. This is the process of progressively looking more like Jesus. Let's ask a question. Make sure everybody's awake. Who is the source of sanctification? Who is it that makes us like Christ? Well, ultimately, it is God that enables the progression of looking more like His Son. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 6 says this, Not by might or by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who is working in your heart right now to make you more like Jesus? The Holy Spirit is. He's the one that gives you that yearning, that, that hunger, that thirst for righteousness. He's the one that is constantly molding and shaping you, even when you don't want to be molded and shaped. In our stubbornness and in our sin and our pride, the Lord who began a work in you, he's, he's still working. He hasn't given up on you. But I also want us to see there's an inseparable link between human effort and divine power in the process of sanctification. Ultimately and chiefly, it's the Holy Spirit working in our heart. But there's also a link to us pursuing the Lord. So as believers, our job in sanctification is this. It's to yield ourselves over to God. It's to pursue holiness on a daily basis. It's, it's reading the Word. It's soaking it up. It's praying. It's, it's exercising the spiritual disciplines. Always proceeding forward in dependence on Him. Now, for me, in my simple mind, and I'll be honest, I have a pretty simple mind. My mind is like a coffee pot. All right? You guys tracking with me for a second? I'm not talking about the fancy coffee pots. I'm talking about the one you put the filter in, and you dump the coffee, and then you, it's a, just a regular drip coffee maker. It takes a while for my mind to, to process like an old-fashioned coffee pot. Sometimes I like to think my mind's like a Keurig, which you just hit the button, and it just comes up with a glorious product. It's not like that. Sometimes I forget to put the little cup in. So, so here, let me, let me explain this for just a second. So... As believers, God's Spirit and His Word's working in our life, but we also put forward effort in sanctification as well. It's hard for us to understand how all this works, but Paul summarized it in a pretty good way when he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. This mind-blowing process of the Spirit working us, working as well. He says this, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. That's what he says. This is the human effort side. 
Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the process of pursuing the Lord. And then he says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. All right, so again, let's, let's get back to the text. Look in your Bibles at verse number 23. I want to I look at some of these words and calm through them for just a second. Verse 23 says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Now we know what sanctify means, to set apart for the purpose of holiness, separate from sin, but then Paul uses this word, the God of peace himself. What Paul is doing there is he's underscoring who accomplishes sanctification. You see what the Bible says? It says God himself. Himself is the Greek word autos. It, it means it's an emphatic position. Let me dig a little deeper for just a second. God does not delegate the sanctification process to an angel or to somebody else. God himself is actively involved in making you more like his son Jesus. But he doesn't do it from a distance. He's actively involved in every intrinsic detail of your life. The good, the bad, the ugly. God uses those things to make you like Jesus. All right, so we've, we've dug in a little bit. We've, we've covered what God himself means. Now, look again at verse number 23. It, it goes on to say, the, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you. And then notice the word there. It says completely. Some of your translations may say entirely. This word in the Greek, it's only used here once in the New Testament, this word entirely, completely. What does it mean? In the Greek, entirely is a combination of two different words. So the first word, holos, which means whole and complete. The second word it's combined with is telos, which means end and finished. So when you combine these two words together, what Paul was praying for, for the church at Thessalonica, is that God would work completely and wholly in the life of the Thessalonians until the end. That He was praying that God would not leave any part of these church members unaffected by change, by the setting apart from sin and setting to holiness. All right, let's move on to number two. Our second point here this morning. Notice we see the sanctification of human components. All that means is God even affects our earth suit. Sanctification even affects our bodies. So sanctification doesn't just involve our spirit and our soul. It also affects the body. Look in your Bible at verse number 23. It says, to sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he gives us three indicators of what's affected by God's work. The spirit, the soul, and the body. Now we just read over that and say, man, that was good words. What does it mean? Contextually, when Paul includes body, I mean, this would have been mind-blowing for a Greek culture. Now let me explain this just a little bit more. The culture around the church, so all the unbelievers there in Thessalonica, they believed in what's called dualism. Some of you guys may have heard of it. They believed that your internals, your heart and your soul, was intrinsically good. You're just a good person. God made you a good person on the inside. You have a good heart. And they taught that the flesh was intrinsically evil. So here, Paul's saying, hey, listen, God doesn't just change you on the inside. God also changes you on the outside as well. Now let me explain this just a little bit more. This culture didn't think a lot about their body. In fact, they dismissed sinful physical behavior. Hey, it's just my body. I can do with it whatever I want. You guys catch the drift so far? Paul's saying, even how you use your physical body should be affected by the way God works in your heart. All right, so Paul taught 
the thinking of the Greek culture was just disgusting. Listen to what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Paul says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your, in your body. When God sets us apart, when God saved you, guess what? He began this process of working on you. He didn't just work on the inside, he's working on the outside as well, especially your body. Our bodies think and feel and act in response to the holiness of our inner being. So whatever's on the inside causes us to speak or to act. Now, this was contrary to culture. People didn't, let me, I don't want to get to my invitation yet, but let me explain this for just a second. Let me apply this. When you become a believer, when Christ changes your heart, that should affect what you do with your body. <laughs> do you understand that it should change the way that you eat? It should change the, your exercise habits. You understand that when you become a Christian and God internally works inside of you, you understand your body's not your own anymore. You're to be used to glorify God, even in your body. It means that you're no longer to use your body to gratify yourself, but to serve other people. So again, as Paul is cultivating a good biblical response to sanctification. He talks about how sanctification doesn't just affect our minds, our hearts. It also affects what we do with our bodies. There's a lot more I could add, but we need to go on to our third point. Let's notice also sanctification's goal. And I wrote on your screen culmination. It just means the end result. What, where is sanctification headed? Look in your Bible at verse number 23. It says, And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what Paul's doing here is, again, he's praying. He's praying that the church would be preserved, it would be kept until Christ comes back. He desired that they would continue to stay on a path of holiness until Jesus come. When they, and then they would receive ultimate sanctification, right? They would change out that old body of flesh for a glorified body. Now, let's look at the words here in verse 23. He says, your whole, you guys got to look at your Bibles for this to make sense. It says, your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept, and he uses a word there. He says, blameless. That was his desire. Now, as I was looking up this word blameless, it, it means clean, holy, uh, without accusation, Paul desired that this church be blameless until Jesus comes back. No one could accuse them of any unrepentant sin. Christ has changed their heart. Now the outworking of that is holy living. Here's a neat little uh, nugget that I found as I was studying this past week. If you were to go back and look, archaeologists have went and dug around the ancient city of Thessalonica. You can actually go visit uh, there today. There's a gentleman that was it, is within the uh, context of our church. He's actually been to Thessalonica. How cool would that be? But anyways, to make a long story short, if you were to go there today, you could go see grave markers from during this time. And they would used to identify believing Christians with a little, uh, just a little saying on their grave. And you know what it said? What it says on some of these early Christians' graves there at Thessalonica, it says blameless. Now that's pretty cool. I like when archaeology and science finally catch up to the Bible. So Paul said, hey, we want you to be blameless. These people are literally marked by blamelessness. That's God's desire for the whole church for us to be blameless. All right. Then he goes on to say in verse 23, at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Let's Stay pure, let's stay holy till Christ comes back. Um, I encourage you, hold your place there in 1 Thessalonians and look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
I told you the Lord has been preparing a meal this past week. Some of you guys are trying to hurry and chew up the meat. It's hard to get swallowed. Some of you guys need some banana pudding to kind of wash it down. So let's, let's look at first. That was a joke, guys. All right. <laughs> first Corinthians chapter 15. Now look at verse number, uh, let's start in verse number 50. This talks about when God will make believers sinless forever. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 50, says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For the perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must be on immortality. Verse 54. But when the perishable puts on the imperishable, then the mortal puts on immorality, and then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So let me just summarize that for those that are glazing over. So, to clear this confusion, the coming of the Lord is a reference to the rapture of the church when God will call up those who believe in Him. So Paul's praying that when Christ comes for believers, He will find them faithfully pursuing holiness until they receive their promised heavenly perfection. So, layman's terms. Paul's praying that we would pursue the Lord, we become like Christ, until Jesus comes back. So that's his prayer. Now notice our last point here this morning, number four, sanctification's final security. This process in which God started in your life, if you've turned from sin, it can't be stopped. God's continuing to work. Look in, look in verse number 24. The Bible says this, He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Paul was confident that God's going to continue to do what he said he's going to do. He started the process. He's not going to stop. doesn't matter how old you are. God's continuing to work in your heart to make you more like Jesus. You don't just receive. You don't just come to a place in your life where you're done growing spiritually. Listen to this, Philippians 1, verse number 6. I'm about to share an illustration with you, but you need to listen to this verse. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I met a boy one time um, up at school, and apparently before he become a believer, he had taken some prescriptions that he really probably shouldn't have taken. And he just kind of blacked out. Well, he woke up with a Bible verse tattooed on his back. Only half of the Bible verse. And half of it was this. Uh, Philippians 1.6. It said this. Bring to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So here's this unbeliever walking around with half of a Bible verse tattooed on his back. So he started investigating. He started looking at what Bible verse is this? <laughs> I'm telling you, I've seen, well, we won't get there. So he starts looking it up. He starts asking people. He goes to a local church less than 100 miles away from this one, and he asks the pastor, what is this on my back? And the guy began to explain to him Philippians chapter 1, verse number 6, that he who begins a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so then he starts asking questions. What work are you talking about? The pastor shares the gospel with him. This guy gets saved. He ends up surrendering the call to preach. And he ends up at, up at Boyce College. And, and then I, I'm like, this guy's telling me the biggest thing. Then he lifts his shirt up. And then he didn't even have the tattoo finished on his back. Anyways, we won't go there. But the point is this. When God begins a work in your heart, he's going to bring it about to completion. He's going to carry you through. He's not going to give up on you. Salvation is secure, and the process in which God makes us like Jesus is also secure. It is God who graciously calls us. It's God that graciously supplies us with the faith to repent, and it's God that provides the grace to per persevere all the way to the end. Listen to what the Bible says, Romans 8, 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together 
for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. These whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. All right. So I want to head, head to the landing strip. I want us to be able to land with what we learned about today. I want us to apply this, and then I want to issue an invitation. So let's apply this first. What does this passage and everything we talked about this morning have to do with us? What, if I go out to eat at Miguel's after church, which I'm not, if you guys are, congratulations. But if I was to go to Miguel's after church, and somebody walks up to me and say, what did y'all talk about at church this morning? Here's some pointers that you can talk about. Number one, experiential, let me just say it this way. Sanctification in our life is positive and negative. How so? How is sanctification negative? Sanctification is negative because God sets us apart from sin. He removes negatively. He, he, He takes away sin from our life. He purges it out. Now, sanctification, you guys need to understand this, does not remove the presence of sin around us. When God started a work in your heart, He didn't just take you out of the world. It's entirely possible when you show up to the job site tomorrow, you're going to be surrounded by sin. God's still working in your heart. He doesn't take you out of it. What He does, instead, He purges the believer of His love for sin. And he begins to decrease sin's frequency within our life. God don't take you out. He takes the love of sin from you. And you start sinning, start sinning less. That's the negative aspect, which is really positive. But the positive aspect of sanctification is that sanctification takes our old dirty minds and he renews it. He begins to give us new thoughts begins to give us new affections, a new desire and a new hunger for righteousness and purity and and uprightness. God uses His Word, God uses His Spirit to cultivate both negative and positive change in the believer's life. So that's one point of application. Number one, understand when you show up to work tomorrow, all sin's not going to be eradicated from the job site. People are still going to be cussing and spitting or I'm just making things up now but understand God's going to remove your love for sin as you pursue him with a relationship and through his word and spirit. Number two in application sanctification mainly takes place in the heart in the mind, the soul and in the inner being sanctification is not behavior modification It's not about changing the way you act. Sanctification is about inward change. The problem is not the way you act or what you think. The problem is internal within your heart. Your heart's sinful. Your heart needs to be changed. Peter illustrated this to a bunch of believing women in 1 Peter. Chapter 3, verses 3-4, through he said, You're a doorman. Your adornment must not be merely external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold jewelry, or putting on dressing, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So when we talk about sanctification, when we talk about being changed, don't think about just the outside. Think about your heart. God's going to change your old, nasty, rotten heart. Third point of application, sanctification is an ongoing reality. Sanctification doesn't happen overnight. I'm going to use somebody as an example this morning. Excuse me, Mr. Eric Barr. Just because I've seen his his head's glaring, just the way that light, I'm just kidding. So when, when Eric Barr was saved, the Lord radically changed his life. Eric Barr is not the same man today as he was when he was first saved. Eric Barr is not going to be the same man that he is in three years if the Lord chooses to tarry. Sanctification is an ongoing process in which the Lord changes 
our heart, our desires. Now, it doesn't mean that we'll never sin again once God starts a work in our heart. It just means we'll stop living an unbroken pattern of sin in our life. We'll start a new pattern in our life of holiness, of pursuing the Lord. Fourth, we need to remember as a church and as individuals, many people counterfeit sanctification. Many people live a fake faith. You may outwardly be tricked that the Lord's working on somebody's heart and in their life, but in fact, they're just learning to, to adhere to church tradition better. Or out of fear of God and out of uh, wanting to earn God's forgiveness, they change the way they act. That's not real sanctification. Changing the way you act out of a, a fear of, of punishment and out of a, uh, how can I say this, wanting to earn God's forgiveness isn't real sanctification. Real sanctification comes when God's children understand God's sincere love for them. It's, it's grace mode. The way they change their behavior is out of grace. It's, it's out of a desire to become like Christ, not a desire that, oh, I'm going to face punishment. Grace-motivated obedience. So don't, don't see, when you see people and you're like, man, maybe the Lord's doing something in their life, but they're just counterfeiting, we need to, we need to get to the real, uh, the real issue. Let me move on to our next point. Maybe this will clarify. As a believer, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, Understand, one of God's top priorities in your life is your sanctification. God desires to set you apart from sin and to set you towards holiness. It's God's will for you. It's the result of Christ dying for you. This is what the Bible says. In Titus 2, verse number 14, it talks about Christ. It says, Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed. deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. One of the reasons why we live is for sanctification. One of the reasons why we live is to become more like Jesus every single day. 1 John 2, 6 says this, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So here's the invitation. I've already, I've already given you application now here's the calling to come. Here's some questions for us to work through in our own heart. First question is this. Has God planted the seeds of righteousness in your heart? Has there been a moment in your life that you, you understand who you really are? Not who you'd like to be or who you think you are, but you understand biblically who you really are, a sinner in need of grace. Has there been a moment when God's planted the seeds of righteousness in your heart? And have they begun to take root and grow and push the other trash out? Another honest question, because here's the test. How do you know if God's planted the seeds of righteousness in your heart? Are you genuinely growing in Christ's likeness. Look at the past three weeks of your life. Do you look more like Jesus today than you did three weeks ago? Like this is something we, we need to constantly be running back to. Am I honestly growing in the Lord? Or do I have a counterfeit faith? I look good, but there's no real substance within are you counterfeiting spiritual growth? Are you, are you showing up to the services? You're checking the box. You actually sing on some of these songs, but you're just a counterfeit Christian. You can't fake God's work in your heart. I want to ask another question because this will help us to understand, are you the real deal or are you, or are you fake? Do you have an unbroken pattern of sin in your life? 
Is there something in your life where you say, man, I know this, this isn't right. But I just keep doing it because I love to do it. I love my sin. I love the flesh. I'm talking now to the unbeliever, to the counterfeit Christian, the, the person that does check all the boxes, but there's no real heart change. This morning, I'm not asking, this is an invitation. You can either accept it or reject it. I'm not asking you to come forward this morning and to recommit your life to Jesus. All right? Because you can't commit something that was never committed in the first place. I'm not asking you to come forward and say, uh, Lord, just help me to uh, keep on this self-righteous path in which I can do right things, because you're just going to fail again. You're just going to keep being a counterfeit Christian. What I'm asking for this morning to the counterfeit Christian and, and to the unbeliever, are you done? Are you tired of your sin? Are you tired of looking like the world? Are, are you tired of desiring the things that the world desires? Living like the world does. Do you know what the Bible says about the world? 1 John 2.15 says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you showed up this morning and said, man, I like what the world likes. I like to do what the world does. Heed the words here in 1 John 2, 15. The love of the Father is not in him. The problem here this morning, the reason why you're not growing spiritually, the reason why your life is in chaos, let's just say this before we go on. Like you have a problem. The problem is not your spouse. The reason why you're not growing spiritually is not your spouse's fault. All the, the problems that you're facing in life is not because of the economy. The reason why you're facing all these problems is not because of your job or the media. The reason why you're not growing is because of you. Nobody likes to be pointed at. But the reason why people are not growing spiritually is because their heart is sick. It's utterly sinful. They have a leper's heart. The reason why people don't grow spiritually is because sin is at the center of their life instead of the Lord. The problem is that your favorite God is you. You're worshiping you and what you want and what you desire instead of worshiping the only one worthy of our worship. So what is the solution? What's the solution to the person who, who doesn't look different than they did three weeks ago? To the person that just kind of has just fallen off the wagon. They're not even here at church this morning. They couldn't even roll out of bed and show up. What's the solution to the person who's never really seen internal change in their life? question is this, have you ever been sanctified? Have you ever been set apart? Have you ever been separated from sin and pushed towards holiness? Are you experiencing the ongoing process in which God is increasingly setting you apart from sin and moving you towards holiness? Because your counterfeit sanctification fools two people. It fools the people around you, but it also fools yourself. You're not getting anywhere. Are you here this morning and you need a relationship? You need a new heart. Because your heart is just producing sinfulness. You need a new heart that only God gives that produces holiness. I want to talk to the believer this morning, and then we'll be done. Believer, what is your goal in life? I mean, what, do you, what, do you, what are you doing with your life? Is it just to work hard, get a nice house, have a big family, and retire? I 
want you guys to understand, God's goal for your life is not your comfort. God's goal in your life, biblically, is not your health or your wealth. Now, people are already shaking their heads because they're not used to this. But I, I, I want to be honest with you guys this morning. God's priority for your life is not your comfort. It's your holiness. God desires more than anything else to make you like Jesus. So that means he will do whatever it takes to make you like Jesus. One of your top priorities in life is to become like Jesus Christ, to look like him, to have his desires. Is that a priority in your life right now? Because if it's not, believer, you're sinning. You're living in unrepentant sin. One of your top priorities and goals every single morning is to wake up and to feast with Christ, to get in the Word, to know him more. He works through his word. He works through his spirit to make you more like him. Is sanctification a top priority in your life as an individual? But what about your family? I mean, this is super convicting. A top priority in our lives as parents and grandparents and as leaders of the church and Sunday school teachers is to not only introduce our children to Christ, but to help them in every way to become like Christ. Is that a priority in your life, or is, or is this secondary? I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And there's, there's, there's literally nothing else I can add. Now we need to turn our hearts to the Lord and ask Him to reveal to us any sinful, wayward, prideful way that we approached the Word this morning and ask Him to to forgive us is simply to repent. To say, Lord, I'm not, I'm not growing in the way that I should. I don't desire the things that I should. Lord, please help me. I understand I can't do it. <laughs> I've tried. I'm done. I, you're going to have to just take over. Just declare that your spiritual bank account is so in the negative. <laughs> you need Jesus' imputed righteousness on your account. If you're here this morning and Christ has never saved you, then why don't you go ahead and call out to, to him and go ahead and fix positionally where you stand before God. It's, it's a simple prayer of faith. Asking the Lord to forgive you. Confessing your need. And crying out to him understanding that He is the only way by which we can be saved. Give Him your whole being, and you won't regret it. Lord, as we come to this moment of invitation, I pray that the invitation would have come forward in a clear way, and that, Lord, you would use my feeble attempt of serving a meal, and you would take it and allow, through your Holy Spirit, this meal to be digested, and you would use it, for spiritual nourishment. Lord, if this is the, the first morning anybody's ever ate a spiritual meal, pray that they would let that be known this morning. Or if there's anybody here that needs to be saved, they need to start that new life with Christ, pray they would come. And you give them a boldness to do that. Lord, please work in this invitation according to your will. And we're going to give you the glory for whatever happens. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.